Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. My name is Jason Ruwalt. I'm with Time Warner Cable. I've got uh, two members of my team here, um, Sean Lynn and David Medbury. And we're going to spend some time talking to you about the Time Warner Cable deployment. We think we've done some pretty cool stuff. We, we think we have some good learnings that we can share with you. Um, and we'd also like to talk to you a little bit about our path forward. Um, so let's get going. Uh, just real briefly, a, a little bit, what, you know, who is Time Warner Cable? Um, we are the second largest uh, cable provider in the US. We, uh, we provide video, phone, broadband services um, to all our customers. We're located in 29 states. We have about 15 million subscribers. And, we all, and a big part of those subscribers are in the two largest markets, which is uh, Los Angeles and New York City. Now, to support those services, we have quite a bit of infrastructure. So we've got uh, four national data centers. And we have over 20 market and regional data centers. So there's quite a bit of uh, infrastructure that needs to go in place to support uh, uh, cable. So the Time Warner Cable, the, the last few years, has really trying, it has had a mission or a vision to transform television um, and really uh, take it from the style that it is um, or has been of being able to deliver um, content at very specific times of days um, in, to people's homes on their televisions and really move it to this notion of having you know, kind of any content, anytime, anywhere, on any device. And as you can imagine, to make that type of shift in the television industry or the cable industry uh, actually requires quite a bit of change. Those changes span from uh, technical to cultural to organizational. So from a, a technology standpoint, you know, we're doing a lot to roll out new set-top boxes, new software to support those boxes, new architecture changes to support transcoding and video content delivery. Also, there's a lot of new um, software platforms now for all the different uh, consumer devices, right? So a lot of technology changes are going into place, as well as uh, then from the cultural perspective, and we actually have an interesting talk right after this in another room talking about the culture changes um, that uh, Time Warner Cables has undergone from an OpenStack perspective. Um, but as you can imagine, um, there's, there's a, culture plays a big part of this, um, really moving from this notion of very slow, methodical, deliberate delivery mechanisms to very rapid, fail-fast delivery, right? Um, and then organizationally, we're you know, restructuring our teams to DevOps um, organizations to deliver on all these changes. So why OpenStack and, and, and open source? Well, we really think it's simple. It's, it's the platform, right? It's going to provide the ability for us to be able to um, you know, deliver on this whole model of being able to have very fast, flexible, reliable scale-out services with programmatic interfaces. And there are a lot of other benefits as well. Um, most everybody here is aware of those, so I'm not going to go into those. Um, so what did we do at Time Warner Cable? Well, about a year ago, it was uh, January of 2014, we embarked on a vision of, well, let's stand up OpenStack, um, and we'll have a certain set of requirements that we'll, we'll try, to, uh, try to hit. And we're going to try to do this in six months. So the first one was we wanted to have um, our OpenStack clouds to span two regions. Um, and uh, so that was a key requirement. We wanted obviously self-service capabilities. That's you know, what most people want. Uh, our customers um, really want the ability to have a hands-on and be able to spin up instances very fast. Um, we needed to support thousands of VMs. We wanted our identity system uh, to be global. So your, your identity carries with you between regions. And it's also tied into our corporate credential system. Um, key to this was the, the control plane infrastructure that we wanted for this cloud deployment. We wanted it to be very highly available and uh, have DR components to it because we we're going to have um, our customers putting mission critical applications on this. So our control plane infrastructure needed to have those same tenants of HA and DR. Uh, live migration was also a key driver uh, into why we implemented certain things um, that you'll see a little bit later. But it was very important to us that we could actually move our customers' workloads around with no impact to them. Um, we wanted to be able to do that so we could service the physical hardware, so that we could upgrade the OS, upgrade the kernel, things like that. 
Um, automation, automation, automation was kind of a key tenet. We wanted to be able to do everything in an automated way. We wanted to keep hands and manual changes out of production. So we, we wanted to automate all our software deployments, all the integration, and also the configuration of the bare metal systems. So we worked on this for six months, and we hit our target. We, went, we got to production um, July 1st uh, of last year. Um, and all the while we did that, we also built a team um, to deliver on this. So we were kind of doing two things at once. We didn't have a team in place that was going to deliver on, on uh, all these requirements. So we, uh, you know, we brought some talent um, in through other parts of the organization. We hired externally. Um, and, and, and we also, at the same time, brought in all the tools and processes that are required of a DevOps organization. So one of the things that's important when you're bringing uh, OpenStack private cloud like this to an organization like Time Warner, Cable, Time Warner Cable or any large enterprise is that it's very important that you educate the customers on, on, the, on what they're getting into. Um, it's, a very, it's a very different environment, um, OpenStack, from what they're traditionally used to using. And so, we spent a lot of time, and again, this is coming in another talk, in the cultural talk, but we spent a lot of time educating our customers, um, and we wanted to um, make it understandable why they should move on to the cloud. Um, so we put together a little promotional video, and I thought I'd share that with you before we dive into the details of our deployment. So I'm going to go ahead and play this video here. Kind of a uh, cute, kind of simple little video, but it actually um, it, it actually does a good job for people who aren't familiar with cloud and virtualization technology. Kind of what the, the power is, you know, uh, of those uh, the tools and capabilities, and the advantages they get from it. Right, the speed. There's a lot of key key buzzwords in there, but they actually ring true. Right, you know, people get tired of waiting months to be able to get a uh, 
uh, machine and then have to work with another group to get networking set up in another group, right? So this really opens it up so that uh, it, it empowers our, our, our customers that are building applications to actually really move at light speed. Um, so as, far, as an overview of what we've deployed, and, and again, we're gonna get more detail, um, we have out and running now all the core IIS services. So as you can see here, Nova Glance, Cinder, Neutron Swift, Keystone Horizon, we also have Heat um, out there. That's not on this slide here. Um, we're up and running in the two national data centers, as you saw there. So we have two regions. We have about roughly 5,000 VM capacity at this point, and we're actually um, adding that capacity very rapidly. We're having a, a ton of adoption. Um, the SWIFT that we've stood up is replicated in two regions, and this goes along with kind of this notion that we wanted to have and bring to our customers is that, you know, this actually provides a very good DR strategy for you, right? You can, there's a, lots of things you can back up, things that you're running in the cloud that you can back up, drop into SWIFT, and it's available right away um, and replicated into the other, other region. From a storage standpoint, we have about one petabyte today combined op object and blo um, block storage. And our, the networking that we have enabled is using Neutron. We're using ML2 with VXLAN overlay. So each of our customers has their own, their own private network space. And we'll talk about that more uh, here when Sean gets up. Um, and then the keystone uh, that we're using, again, is we've enabled with hybrid auth, which we'll talk to you more about so that we can kind of get the, uh, the global kind of global identity um, across the regions. Uh, and then the big part of, of standing up a, a cloud, an OpenStack cloud, is, is, is operationalizing it. Um, so a lot of work went into the monitoring and alerting and tooling all around that. Um, and so that it was all implemented as well within that time frame. Um, and and um, last but not least for sure is CICD. So I talked about the automation. We want to automate everything. We spent a great deal of time putting in a complete continuous integration, continuous deployment um, tool chain and set of processes so that we can actually um, rapidly roll out changes to production. Um, we do that weekly, actually sometimes more than weekly. And on some of the services, we're actually already on Liberty. Um, we can pick and choose um, which services that we want um, you know, to be close to trunk on versus not. So some of the more mature services, more stable services, we're OK being on stable. On some of the faster moving services that we're experimenting and playing around with, um, we're actually pulling from trunk. Uh, and so there's, there was a talk already at the summit on our CICD tooling. So hopefully some of you got to see that. All right, next, I'm going to bring up Sean Lin, who's going to go into some of the deployment details. Hi, everybody. My name is Sean Lin. I'm a lead engineer at Time Warner Cable. And let's delve a little bit deeper into what our deployment actually looks like. As Jason mentioned, we have uh, two data centers. Our Keystone is a global data store between both data centers. Tenants and users are the same between both sides. There's no separation there. That was key to us uh, up front. Behind the scenes, uh, you'll see two things. One is that we have a replicated uh, Galera cluster, MySQL, that had some interesting challenges putting up that multi-region. Uh, but it's pretty solid now. Uh, you'll see the Galera arbitrator in there. That's a tiebreaker that's in a third data center. Um, and then we use hybrid auth. Uh, so uh, our Keystone first checks local. Uh, and says that we use this for service accounts specifically. Um, but it also check our corporate Active Directory as well. So any user who comes into the system can log in just like they would with their user ID and password. As Jason mentioned, we use a VXLAN tenant-based network architecture. Uh, pretty early adopter on that. We uh, spiked it in Havana definitely brought it into production in Ice House. Um, and the decision there was to uh, be able to enable our users to have really arbitrary networks, uh, which is they're really not used to in most cases. It, it allows them a lot more flexibility than they had in the past. Uh, we use floating IPs for public access to those uh, applications. This will be things like timewarnercable.com, TWC TV, other actual production apps are in our cloud using this architecture right now. Um, our storage architecture, Swift has been there from day one. We've continued to expand that out. 
Um, I just, uh, at first, we uh, uh, deployed. Um, at first, we deployed in, in both data centers. Uh, day one, site-to-site uh, -site replication was there. Uh, basically, that enabled our DR or, or enabled us to allow our uh, customers a DR strategy. Um, snapshots to the cloud and backups and, and all sorts of neat things that we provided and a knowledge base that we provide to our customers. And uh, recently we put in a Dropbox-like app which has been getting uh, rave reviews internally. Oh yeah, this is so easy to share things now. So um, that uses Swift as a back end. Uh, we also have started off with block storage, um, not initially Ceph, quickly moved there for reasons that were explained in our last talk, which was very interesting. Um, <clears throat> our Ceph deployment is now ter or multiple hundreds of terabytes and it's growing all the time. We've operationalized that. And really the enabler, this enabled live migration uh, up front. Uh, right now we're looking at other options. We're expanding into multiple tiers of storage. So we'll have a pure SSD storage solution pretty quick. Um, <clears throat> and uh, enable our customers to uh, select what type of storage option they would like. As Jason mentioned, one of our original requirements, our mandates, in fact, was live migration. Uh, this is a very uncloudy thing to do, some people think, but it enables us operationally to, uh, as administrators, to, uh, to administer our cloud much easier. I would say that this should be almost a requirement for anybody who's putting up a cloud. Uh, otherwise, you have to kill instances on nodes and call customers up. And for us, that's just not cool. Uh, we have a lot of customers who are quickly enabling their applications for the cloud and becoming very cloudy and cloud aware and scale out horizontally and it doesn't matter if their app goes down, but not all of our customers are there. And so this really is important to us. Um, <clears throat> we have kind of an interesting high availability strategy. We're trying to do active active on any of the services any of the service interactions that we can whenever possible. <coughs> and basically this is to allow us deeper flexibility in upgrades, in uh, code deployments, and less downtime for our customers is what it comes down to. Monitoring has been there from, I would say, day 0.75, as we were initially standing up the cloud, it was actually a requirement for us. Definitely start small. We use Isinga. It came with a host of tests that are there anyway. We enabled those, then started weeding things out. And as we ran into problems, we basically solved the problem, add a new Isinga test, write it out. Just use that as part of your development process and keep building it up. Now we have hundreds and hundreds of tests uh, that are run, and it allows us to be a lot more proactive on, uh, on overcoming problems that come up and actually preventing it in a lot of cases. A lot of times now, our customers never see the problem because we've fixed it before they've seen it, which is a great place to be. Um, <clears throat> in addition to a monitoring strategy, we had to have people respond. We use PagerDuty. Um, and we have a call rotation. We are a true DevOps organization, so there's no uh, throwing code over the fence. You actually have to eat your own dog food and you have to help customers uh, out on a daily basis. And you have to get up uh, once every three months and deal with whatever the alerts come off. So that's actually a little bit annoying if you live it, but it also makes you much, much more responsive to your customers' needs and to the changes that you're putting into the field you're a lot more sensitive to what the impacts are. Uh, <clears throat> lastly, we use Isinga. Uh, we had initially delved into Solometer and ran into some scaling issues with that. We are currently uh, using Manaska more and more. We'll have our internal administrative monitoring through a dashboard in Manaska. And by end of year, we're, it's on our roadmap to provide uh, our customers with um, monitoring as a service. So they'll have uh, default dashboards and be able to create limited new dashboards. Uh, Jason 
has mentioned automation up front. Um, automation and CI, CD, I would say, are so part of our culture of our team right now that I can't even imagine living without it. <laughs> um, I think you have to start small on this as well and iterate and grow. Um, basically, we're using uh, Cobbler and Ubuntu Pre-Seed to kick, start, or kick everything into place, and then we're using individual host management as via Puppet and Puppet modules, typically StackForge, um, and then a lot of custom modules that we've uh, started committing upstream. We have some really we have core contributors in the Puppet regime here. And uh, where Puppet fails often is orchestrating rollouts. It, it has no notion of this change needs to be applied to this system before that system. So uh, we had a previous talk, but sh in short, uh, <clears throat> Ansible is used. We turn off Puppet and we roll, we do our weekly changes, our code rollouts via Ansible, roll out the change, restart Puppet, and we can orchestrate our entire cloud uh, upgrades this way. The more that we rely on external code sources, the more they become a single point of failure. So we've started mirroring and bringing a lot of the code sources in-house. That actually improves our rollout speed as well as our uh, ability to keep up with all the, the changes that are happening in-house. In um, <clears throat> a key one, again, is upgrades should be intentional and frequent. The longer that you let bugs lie in place in OpenStack, the more difficult it is to upgrade this. Uh, up front, we started running a little bit behind, and uh, in the last six, eight months, it's been a massive task of ours to clean this up. We can now do deployments on demand. We can always get better. You talk to our CI, CD guys, they're after one touch. But compared to where we were a year ago, this is really flexible and really, really important. <laughs> Everything's automated, or most things are automated, and the upgrades are weekly. And in fact, in a dev environment, it's six times a day. Um, our environments start off with a development environment. We can roughly simulate everything a developer, any developer, can simulate uh, our entire production cloud on our production cloud to test changes. This includes Ceph, Swift, basic services. You can bring up what you need, test out code changes, <coughs> submit to, to our internal Git repository, excuse me. <coughs> And it really speeds our development. We aren't sharing a development environment and stepping on each other's feet. And uh, one thing that this also enabled is there's usually a process of deploying a code change and you roll it out and you keep, you have no idea and no insight on whether this code change can rebuild from scratch. So this, uh, having the virtual environments improve that ability. And so we kind of, I kind of, uh, related this before, but here's the process. Each individual developer has a virtual environment up in the cloud. That's 100% theirs. Through Git changes, they submit to the master branch, and that gets uh, basically, uh, we use Garrett, plus minus, um, you get submitted to the master branch. That goes out to our development environment where another battery of tests are run. Um, to go to uh, staging and production, we tag that, and then we migrate into both of those environments. And this is done uh, on a weekly basis or more to production. <coughs> we continue to improve our CI CD tool chain. This is actually super key for us. Um, as we start moving closer and closer to trunk and mix and match our services, the ability to, via Git upstream, pull down upstream changes, manage pat local patches, merge and merge is important. We use the essentially a process that's very much like the upstream OpenStack process. It makes it a lot easier on us and the tooling's the same. So we do have Garrett and there's unit tests run and Jenkins and all the goodness on that. We continue in, to employ or to improve our ability to test and to roll out, which is the Jenkins Ansible portion. <laughs> uh, 
I think you have to, one of the first things that you have to change in, in a culture, this is my read of it, it, and we did this up front, is if you expect to yum update and, and go and massively, in, and then wait until from uh, Juno to Kilo, you're lost. You have to have a better process in place in your, your team and within your company to, thank you, to, uh, to upgrade. And we now have a process where we can, in minutes in some cases, especially on our Horizon UI, deploy a change to production. Um, just don't wait, deploy early and deploy often. As far as massive upgrades go, definitely test these full upgrades. So if you're going from Juno to Kilo, we have the ability in-house to test this whole process and more and more testing that goes on there. Test database migrations, test uh, upgrading services, test the order that services have to be upgraded in. Um, you need to think about these things and uh, improve the process. I know that we've gotten bit in a couple places and now we are better and better every time. And then I'm gonna turn this over to Dave Medbury. Hello, I'm Dave Medbury. I work for Time Warner Cable for a little over a year now. And uh, I asked specifically for this slide. I do wanna talk about uh, working with the OpenStack community. That's why we're here this, uh, this week. Um, and these are just some tips. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, uh, but join the mailing list. There's a mailing list for every project, Nova, Neutron, Puppet, uh, Chef, uh, whatever. There's a mailing list for every single one. That's actually a requirement to be part of the OpenStack community. Um, participate in meetings. There's meetings occurring every single day, almost every hour of every day. They're largely done in IRC, so you need to be familiar with IRC. Um, and just join the meetings. And if you just Google for that, you'll find the right meetings. Um, but let's talk about some meetings that you might not know about. Obviously, there's meetings here this week. There's design sessions, there's operator sessions, and then there's uh, seminars or marketing sessions or whatever you call what I'm doing right now. Um, so, so, so that's the kind of meetings that you probably know about. But there's also mid-cycle meetings. So every, every project has the opportunity to do a mid-cycle meeting. They will either use that to iron out issues that they're having conflict within the team, or they will use it as a planning session. Um, but that also includes the operators. We're big operators now. We're operating a large cloud, and we have both contributed to those sessions, but we've also uh, taken a lot of value away from those sessions, and they're benefiting all of OpenStack when we do that. All of OpenStack gets better when operators give feedback, so look for the operator's mid-cycle meetup if you're not familiar with it. Uh, you need to get familiar with community processes. Um, so one of the things you don't wanna do is go in and try and start selling something in a community process. What you really wanna do is in, in, uh, educate people um, and uh, participate and add value to the community process. It's really not a place for marketing things. Um, and some of those community processes are very rigorously enforced, such as code changes, right? There's a, 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 a very detailed uh, way of how to get code into OpenStack. So that's one of the community processes. Another community process is proposing a session like this one. You need to get familiar with that. Um, and you might need to do a little social media to get yourself up on stage. Um, Sean talked a lot about the community tools. He had a couple of slides. We are heavy users of the community tools. I'm not just talking OpenStack, but I'm talking OpenStack infrastructure. Uh, Garrett, Git, um, Zool, uh, Jenkins, uh, every, what? Not Zool, okay, well, we don't use Zool. But uh, uh, Puppet, I mean, there are tools out there. There are, every, every, a lot of people have done work um, anybody that has checked in a gate, uh, gate commit knows that there is a gate, and that gate is basically operational tools that you can bring into your own organization and use. Um, there's value in the work of others, all right? So, so you do need to do this community work. You need to participate in this session. You need to participate in this bigger uh, summit, but you need to participate on a daily, weekly basis, um, especially things you're interested in, and if you're an operator, things you have problems with. There's a very excellent mailing list for operators that keeps us uh, basically updated on what all the other operators are seeing. But I'm really up here to talk about pain points, and uh, uh, 
If you've been an operator, you know about RabbitMQ is one of our pain points. We had a session a couple days ago, a very good session, that uh, told us that uh, things have gotten much better, much better since March, okay? So things have gotten much better. Um, but historically, messaging failures are difficult to detect. Um, the AMQP layer basically pervades all of OpenStack and everything's gotta be responding to it and, and, and behaving properly. And it's not really RabbitMQ's fault. RabbitMQ gets a lot of the blame, but it's really how the OpenStack uh, different services and projects have uh, incorporated RabbitMQ. So queues are tricky, HA queues are tricky. We actually use a, 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 the, the multi-host or multi-node HA not the, uh, not the load balancer or HA proxy type of HA. Um, and failovers happen automatically in Rabbit, but not all the services are aware of it. So you, you be aware of that. That has actually gotten fixed in Oslo messaging where most of the problems, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say they were coming from, but that was the most susceptible to them. And in Kilo, that's basically all fixed. So if you're on Kilo, you're probably not an operator at production scale or you moved very, very quickly. Um, but uh, when you get to Kilo, you'll see that those are fixed. Most of them are being backported to earlier releases by the distros. Heartbeating was one of the big issues there as well, um, and that also landed in Kilo. Um, and as you can tell, operators are focusing on RabbitMQ because it has caused us a lot of those late nights or early mornings uh, or hair pulling out. Um, Neutron, everything is a network problem. Um, I believe if you were in the uh, Ceph talk that we did a couple hours ago, you will hear that everything is, a, everything is a networking problem because it's just kind of the easiest thing to blame. So the networking guys, like Sean, have to defend themselves every single day and prove that it's not a networking problem because everything's a networking problem until it's proven not to be. Um, and even the RabbitMQ problems. We didn't know what was going on. We thought there was actually network traffic down, that were, there was something broken in the network. Well, it really wasn't. It was a messaging issue. Um, uh, neutron problems lead to angry customers because they can't get to their instance. If they can't get to their VM, they get very upset because their, whatever their VM is doing can't be done. Um, one of the best tips we have is to stay up to date as much as possible on open vSwitch. There were a number of bugs that got fixed after, after the Ice House release that, uh, that didn't get really, really, really fixed until much later, like Kilo. So you, you may need to upgrade your open vSwitch faster than your vendor, if you have a vendor, uh, would like you to. But you've got to take care of you. Um, only the brave use newest networking features. We're semi-brave. So we did a talk on Designate uh, about an hour ago. Um, that's one of the newer features in the networking realm that we're using. Um, monitoring VMs is tricky. Um, so we like to know if the VMs are like responding, so we ping the VMs all the time. Not, you know, not, not, not continuously, but regularly we ping all the VMs. But if you've set up uh, 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 ICMP, if you've disabled ICMP, we can't ping your VM especially if you've done it inside of your VM and not with Neutron rules. So, you know, monitoring VMs is tricky. Let your customer, your user, your tenant monitor their own VMs and uh, only, only really worry about it if it was pingable and stops being pingable. Kernel panics happen. Kernel panics happen. Kernel panics happen. Uh, have a plan to handle kernel upgrades. Uh, kernel panels happen and hopefully if they happen more than once, you actually get a kernel dump and you can repair them. You can get a new kernel. Uh, but you have to have a, we, we, we're very big on live migration, but live migration doesn't help you if you're kernel panic because you're not live at that point. So have a plan to handle kernel upgrades. Um, Venom happened last week, week last week. Uh, Venom happened last week. A lot of people had to do kernel upgrades uh, on Thursday. Um, and you don't know when that's gonna happen. So how do you plan on debugging kernels, all right? Do you have a kernel team on your team? Do you have a kernel vendor on your vendor list? You need to think about those things. Um, practice dumping is my best recommendation for how you can prepare your cloud, uh, your cloud infrastructure, not your VMs, your cloud infrastructure for uh, um, uh, kernel panics. Uh, newer kernels are generally better. A lot of times, even your, uh, even your, just a sec. Even your uh, unknown, undetermined kernel panic is actually fixed upstream. You may not be able to prove exactly which patch it was, so try a newer kernel. 
Okay, users. Users are one of our pain points. They might require, they bring value too, okay. They, they might require some infrastructure as a service education because they might not be doing things in cloudy ways. You need to educate your users. In particular, I'd really recommend that you give them an overview of OpenStack, more than just the cartoon, which is awesome. The cartoon has helped us a lot. Uh, but go beyond that, provide some uh, from hands-on training, some seat-on training, um, and, and get them aware of what, what they should expect. Um, applications they build should be caught aware, and that, that is a cultural shift. Um, tooling, um, so, so the users, there's a lot of tooling in OpenStack, but they may still be doing things the old way. Just kind of advertise to them that there's, there's better ways to do things. If you're using continuous integration and deployment, continuous integration, continuous delivery, why don't you get your users doing the same thing? The tools are already there and you already know about them, so do a brown bag, educate them. All right, pleasant surprises. Users do bring pleasant surprises. We had, we had a training session and the training session went over heat. And within three weeks, we had a couple of kind of heavy duty heat users. Nobody on our team had ever used heat. We knew it was there, we provided the API endpoint, so when heat issues started coming up, Sean and Matt became heat experts overnight. And, uh, but that's a pleasant surprise. And that's because we provided the training. That training included heat. All right, what's next? Uh, process, uh, I, maybe what's next was a slide. Let me look. No, it wasn't, okay. Uh, processes and tooling will do better integration. I think Jason mentioned this earlier. Uh, deployment tool improvements. We're doing Python virtual environments already. Um, cloud edition, so we've got load balancing as a service coming next month. Next month, uh, we've got DNS as a service in beta trial inside of our cloud already. We've got monitoring as a service. There's something that hasn't been talked about much here at the summit that is Manaska, which is monitoring as a service. We're doing it for our infrastructure, but we're also going to open that up to our VM customers so that they can monitor their own VMs. Uh, database as a service is coming soon. It's not immediate, it's not next month. Hadoop as a service. These are all things that we'll be bringing before we talk to you in Tokyo. Um, there are a couple of other sessions coming up. There's one immediately after this, changing the culture at Time Warner Cable. And that was probably the most key thing is Matt Haynes, who's sitting in the back, was able to basically say, we have to do it this way. If you don't buy it this way, we're not gonna try and do it because we need that CIO, CTO, CEO level support. Um, Neutron in the wor real world, Sean's gonna talk at depth at 150. Uh, real world up experiences upgrading OpenStack. Matt Fisher in the front row here. Um, then that's tomorrow. And we're facilitating operator sessions all day. I've got a session right after this, I'm gonna miss Matt's uh, kind of presentation, where we're gonna talk about how operators are having problems and having successes with Ceph. And then later today, there's another operator session about doing OpenStack upgrades, going from uh, Havana to Icehouse to Juno to Kilo, because there are operators still even before Havana. Okay, they're, they're, they're not on stage though. Uh, I think that's all I've got. Thank you. Um, you can reach us. Uh, there is also at TWC Cloud is a Twitter handle that we sometimes print out information. As soon as the slides are available this week, I will definitely put something out on at TWC Cloud and I'll mention app at OpenStack so you guys can all find it.